Good morning. Yes, so much energy. Um, so thank you so much for being here today, taking a break from preparing for the hurricane. We know that um, it's there. Um, so we want to make sure that we are uh, not only preparing ourselves, we're also praying for those who are being affected by it. So we're going to do that here in a little bit. But um, before we get started today, we're talking about the word vision, okay? Vision and sight, being able to see, but we're not talking about the physical kind, we're talking about the spiritual kind. But just out of curiosity, raise your hand if you wear glasses or contacts. Where are my people at? My people! I got contacts in right now, let's go. I remember when I was in elementary school, the moment I realized that I could not see very well, okay? Because my grades started to slip and my parents kind of got upset, but then they realized he can't see, Get that kid glasses, right? I remember that moment for me uh, in my life. Now, raise your hand if you have like perfect 2020 vision. You're like proud about it. Yeah, you guys can leave now. Um, I'm just kidding, but I am really jealous because uh, I would love, that was a joke, that was mean, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, I'm very jealous of that because I don't, I don't have 20-20 vision. In fact, I remember I had a moment in my life where uh, I kind of felt like Velma from Scooby-Doo, you know who I'm talking about, where she like drops her glasses and she can't see them, it's such a weird situation. Well, I had a similar situation. It was the day of my wedding. <laughs> That's a fun way to start. Um, and I remember uh, Tara, my, my wife, or my fiance at the time, she told me, hey, I, I would prefer if you didn't have your glasses on for the ceremony, okay? And she made it very sweet. She said, I wanna see your eyes. <laughs> AKA, I don't like your glasses, kid, okay? Um, so I don't want your glasses on during the ceremony. If you could get contacts before, uh, that would be awesome. So I had one job, and I went too late. Um, and I didn't get them in time for the wedding ceremony. So I had no contacts, only glasses. But I still wanted to honor my wife, okay? You know what I'm saying, my fiance. So uh, the day of the wedding, I had this plan. I had it all mapped out. I'm gonna put my, my glasses in my pocket, right? And when it's time for me to put them on, I'm gonna take them out and put them on so I can see her walk through the doors down the aisle. Cause I wanna be able to see that moment, right? That's a pretty obvious one, okay? So the ceremony is going, I'm up on top of the steps and I am shaking. I am so nervous, I am sweating, TMI, but I am like sweating so much, I'm so nervous. And at some point in the ceremony, uh, the piano starts to build, okay? And you know what's coming, you know the bride's gonna walk down the aisle and the music's building and it clicked with me, I need my glasses. Right, I forgot, I need my glasses. So I'm shaking, I'm panicking now because the music's building. I'm, like, I'm gonna miss it, I'm gonna miss it. So I reach into my pocket, shaking, right? Take out the glasses and I'm like struggling to open them and I like slide them on my sweaty face. And as soon as I get them on, the doors open up. Oh, I can see her, right? And it was an amazing moment. But could you imagine if I missed that? That would not be good, right? I would, I, if I didn't have my glasses on in that moment because I can't see far, I would be looking down the aisle like, is that her? Right? Like, I don't know, okay? <laughs> but I had them on, and I didn't miss the moment. Why? Well, because I could see, clearly. Now, today we're not talking about physical vision or sight. We're actually talking about spiritual vision and sight. We're talking today about how Jesus came to bring sight to the blind, but also to be the light of the world. Check this out. John chapter 8 says this. Jesus is talking about himself. He says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of what? Life. He came to bring light to our lives. Before we jump in, would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Dear Lord, we come before you right now, humbly, asking that you would open the eyes of our heart as we open up your word. God, I pray that you would show us something new today in our faith that's relevant, that's life-changing. God, I pray that we would do whatever we can to follow you to the best of our ability. God, I pray right now for those who are being affected by the hurricane. God, we just pray for protection over them. God, we pray for, for the hurricane as it approaches us more closely. I pray that you would have protection over us as well. But God, not only that, I pray that we are ready as a group, as a church, to be mobilized and to serve and to help people and pray for them in their time of need. God, we're so grateful today that we're in this place together safely, that we get to talk about your word and learn from it. It's in Jesus' name I pray, and everyone said, amen. I've learned something in my life, and I'm sure you've learned this as well, uh, and it's this statement right here. We don't fully understand something until we've experienced it, okay? Can I get a head nod on that if you agree, okay? You don't fully understand something until you experience it. Now, I have, I've seen this in, in two ways in my life, and the first way is the Grand Canyon, Okay, we have a picture of the Grand Canyon I like to put up there, okay? So that's the Grand Canyon, wow, right? Great picture, okay? 
Now, growing up, you hear about the Grand Canyon, you see pictures of the Grand Canyon, you see videos of it, but it's completely different when you go and experience it for yourself. Raise your hand if you've seen the Grand Canyon in person. Yes, right? And you can attest to this. Like, when you step up to this thing, it's so different than pictures. I remember a couple years ago, I got to see it as well, and I step up to where the rail is, and I remember looking up in that moment of just silence. Wow. This is so much better than the pictures and videos and everything they've said. This is incredible. It's so different when you experience it for yourself. The second way that I'm seeing this is literally right now in my life, and it's the process of expecting your first child. My wife, Tara, and I are expecting our first child in January 2020, which is super exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Clap for that baby. Let's go. Tell you what, this world is not prepared for a little sack rider. I mean, woo! It's going to be crazy. Uh, but 2020, we're expecting our first child. We actually have a picture of when we, when we announced this online um, of us holding up. There you go. Aw, it's so cute. It's a little sheep lamb thing. Yeah. Um, so that was cool. Now, we have another picture of Tara holding a sign. She did this. As, she's doing these updates. Yeah, isn't she beautiful? Let's go. Woo! Sorry. Um, so it says there has, you probably can't read it maybe, but it says 18 weeks. Um, her cravings have been pepperoni, cheese, and yogurt. We're getting to that in a second, okay? Um, she's in her second trimester. The baby is now the size of an artichoke. What? Can you pick something different? Like, what in the world? Anyways, um, highlight of the week. Uh, we heard the heartbeat again, so that was cool. Obviously, the highlight for us. Um, and, and mommy is feeling sleepy. Now, we have another picture, um, because I believe I'm coming along pretty well, too. Um, yeah. That's pretty solid right there. Um, now, I don't, I don't care what you think. That's all muscle, okay? That's just so solid. Um, I keep my six-pack in a cooler. Um, sorry. Last joke. Okay. Um, so I'm also 18 weeks. I'm craving coffee, disc golf, and Oreos. Amen, America. Um, my child is the size of half a watermelon. I thought that was a pretty good measurement there. You could probably tell. My favorite highlight of the week, I've taken at least, at least four showers. Okay, at least four showers. Um, and dad is feeling excited. So we're, we're so excited. Now, something with this whole process that I am now experiencing for myself is this whole idea or reality of Tara craving food. Okay. Now, if you've experienced this before, you know what I'm talking about, right? You hear about this growing up, like, oh, when, when a woman is pregnant, she will crave certain foods or she won't crave certain foods, right? And there's like this very uh, line, uh, specific line that you draw where I, I'm experiencing this firsthand right now, okay? It is so different when you're living in, okay? <laughs> Two weeks ago, it was a Sunday night. We're in the car leaving church, and Tara, sweet as could be, looks at me and says, sweetie, I need a milkshake. Okay. We could do that, maybe. Wrong word to use was maybe, okay? She looked at me and said it again with a little bit more intensity. I need a milkshake <laughs> right now. <laughs> so the baby needs a milkshake. All right, where are we going? Wawa. Skirt. I turned to the right instead of left. We got to Wawa and we got her a milkshake. But I'm, I'm understanding it more as I'm experiencing this. And we know that this is true in life. You don't fully understand it until you experience it. It's completely different. Today, the miracle that we're talking about in John chapter 9, there is a man who experiences, experiences this for himself. He didn't understand Jesus until he experienced the power of Jesus. If you have your Bibles, open up to John chapter 9. We'd love for you to join us there. But before we get into that, we need context. Right? We need to know what we're walking into before we start reading. And it actually is in John chapter 8 where we get the perfect context for this story. And Jesus is in a situation in John chapter 8 where he's teaching people in the temple. And uh, there's a group of Pharisees, teachers of the law, right? the Jewish leaders who are there as well. And they're listening to what Jesus is saying. And, and these leaders begin to question who Jesus is. And Jesus makes a statement that was not only bold, but then caused some anger and some problems. Jesus says this, John chapter 8, verse 58 and 59. Jesus is teaching, he says, Very truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they, talking about the Pharisees, picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Okay, so Jesus in this moment, he is referring to himself and he's saying that he is on the same level as God. He says, look, Abraham 
And before him, I already existed. I am. I am, period, point blank. I am equal to God. And they did not like that response. So they literally start picking up stones to kill him. And Jesus, like a ninja, slips out of the temple unscathed. And there's nothing in the text that that leads us to believe that there is a time difference between that moment and what we're reading right now, which I think is crazy. You'll see why in a second, okay? So let's dive into John chapter 9, starting in verse 1. If you want to read along with us, you can with your Bibles. Here we go. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. Talking about Jesus, sees this man. Jesus' disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus responds, he says, neither this man nor his parents have sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me, talking about God. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Now, let's pause here. This next part is going to be free. This is like a holy side note, okay? Because we learned two things about Jesus from this part already in the story, okay? The first thing we learn about Jesus is this. Jesus is personal. Everyone say personal. Not only that, but we learn that Jesus is divine. Everyone say divine. divine. The reason we see that Jesus is personal through this story is because he is running for his life, escaping the grasp of these religious leaders who are trying to kill him. He's running out of the temple from his life, and it says that he sees this man. That's so powerful. Jesus, in this moment, as he is running away from them, as they are trying to kill him, says he sees This man? Now, I believe not only does Jesus see this man in this story, right? People would have passed him by so many times throughout the day, and the person who sees him and stops is the Son of God. Jesus is personal. He saw him. He goes up, and he approaches him, and he starts talking to him. Jesus is personal, and I believe that Jesus sees us as well. Jesus sees you, he sees me, he knows you, he knows your name, he knows your heart, he knows your mind, he knows you. Why? Because he is the son of God. He knows you. He knows what you need. He knows what's going on in your life. Jesus is personal. Now, in the, so far in the story, we also learn that Jesus is also divine. And the way we, can, we, we learn this is kind of in an obscure part of the story. And it's actually the part where he spits on the ground and he makes some mud with his finger, right? Could you just imagine that? Like, imagine being the blind man in this situation. You're just hearing this. Like, what is he doing, right? <laughs> All right? Nasty, okay? But he does this, and he does what I used to do in second grade, right? Maybe you did this. Maybe it's just me. Could be. You go outside, and you would take water, or spit, and you would take mud, and you would mix it together, and you would take that and make a mud pie, and you throw it at your friend. Amen, right? That's what I would do. Jesus doesn't throw it at him, but he puts it over his eyes. Now, the reason this shows that Jesus is divine is because we're actually going to go back to a, a teaching. It's a collection of teachings from the rabbis called the Talmud, right? And the Talmud is something that people of this time would, would know about. It would be like for you and I, as we know um, parts about American history or lyrics to a song, they just knew the teachings that were held inside of this book. And within this book, there was actually a section that talked about saliva. I know, kind of weird, right? But it talked about how the saliva of the firstborn son of a father had healing abilities and was, could be used for medicinal purposes, Okay, so in this moment, Jesus is not just making a holy mud pie. He is making a statement that he is divine, that he is of God, that he is the son of God. He is the firstborn son of God. He's making a statement to the blind man, to his disciples, and to the Pharisees. I'm the real deal. I'm the son of God. He could have snapped his finger. He could have said a word to heal him, but he chose to do this because he was making a statement about who he was. Jesus is divine. That's crazy. Let's keep reading. Uh, Verse 7 of John chapter 9. We're going to keep going with this story. Go, Jesus told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word meant sent or means sent. So the man went and washed, and he came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, 
isn't that the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claim that he was. Others said, nah, it only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I- I'm that guy. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man that they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Now, could you imagine this moment being these neighbors, seeing this man that you know was blind yesterday and now you see him and he can see and you ask him how it happened. He's like, oh, this guy named Jesus put mud on my face and now I can see. Be like, dude, you're crazy, right? Like, I don't know. I'm not sure about that. We're going to keep going. They said, well, where is this man? I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been born blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. So now he's having to explain this story again. You ever been in that situation where someone just doesn't believe you and you're just trying so hard, you're like, please, right? But they're struggling with this. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? They're talking about Jesus. So the Pharisees were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you say about him? It was your eyes that he opened. The man replied, he's a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Calls mom and dad. And they asked this. Is this your son? Is this the one that you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? And his parents' response, they said, we know he is our son. The parents answered, and we know he was born blind, but now he can see. But we don't know who opened his eyes. We don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. Verse 22. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Because they already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That is why his parents said, he's of age, ask him instead. A second time, they summoned the man again who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth. We know this man is a sinner, talking about Jesus. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. What an incredible story, right? We see in this story two very specific things happening. The first one's kind of obvious, right? Jesus gives sight physically to this man, right? We see the miracle account happening, but throughout this story, there is such a greater picture, a greater message that is happening. And it's this right here. Jesus came to not only bring sight to the blind physically, But Jesus came to give sight to the blind spiritually. I'm going to say that again. Jesus came not only to bring sight to the blind physically, but to bring sight to the blind spiritually. And that is for all people. Remember, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Everyone is included in that. I want to bring sight spiritually to those who are your neighbors, your kids, your coworkers, celebrities, to people in power. Everyone is included to that goal to bring sight to the blind spiritually. Jesus says this right before he heals the man in verse four of chapter nine. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And then again, John chapter eight, just before this chapter, Jesus says this about himself. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but they will have the light of life. You see, Jesus throughout his ministry makes it very clear that his purpose, he came to make the world make sense. To make our life make sense. To make things clear once and for all. How to live and how to act with our life. Now let me ask you a question. Uh, Have you ever tried to get ready for the day in the dark? Raise your hand. Just be honest. It's fine. Like, so I did that this morning, right? We've done that before. Okay, I've done that before. You're in a rush and it's still dark outside because it's so early. You're putting on your clothes. You're getting ready. You're like rushed. You're freaking out. And uh, you get ready. You get out the door. You get in your car. You go to where you need to be. And finally, you're in the light. And you look down. Oh, no. 
Today's going to be a fun day, all right? Like, oh no, I'm wearing two different shoes. Or hey, I'm wearing no shoes. Don't know how that happened, but that's a thing. Or hey, my buttons are off. Or hey, my shirt's inside out. Or hey, my fly's down. Woo, that's awkward, right? Like, not good, okay? Why is that? Because everything is more difficult to do in the dark. Everything. Now, here's something else we know about the dark. Everything becomes scarier, right? Everything. Think back to when you were a kid, okay? When you were a kid, I remember uh, the first night for me when I was going to sleep without my nightlight. Big step in life, okay? Going to sleep without the nightlight. You go to bed, you wrap yourself up, all the lights are off, and all of a sudden, you hear every noise. (laughs) Mom, right? And then you look up in the corner of your room and you see this figure. (laughs) Mom? (laughs) Dad? It's the boogeyman, right? I know it is. But then you go, you turn your lamp on real quick and you're super scared. You look up and there it is. That old hockey stick with a jacket on it. (laughs) You got me this time, right? Because everything is scarier in the dark, amen? More difficult and scarier In the dark, that's why Jesus came. Because the same is true spiritually. I want you to catch this, don't miss this. Spiritually, without Jesus, without the light of the world, life is more difficult and it is scarier. Jesus came not only to bring sight to to the blind physically, but he came to bring sight to the blind spiritually. But just because that light is available doesn't mean that we have it. In fact, we have the choice to live in that light, to choose that light, to walk in that light, to have that personal relationship with Jesus. The problem occurs when we don't choose the light. The problem is this, without Jesus, we live life in the dark. Jesus could be so desperately trying to change us and mold us and show us his purpose, but we're living in the light. We're living without him. We're we're not choosing him. And if we're not careful, we can have blind spots in our life, if you will, and in our heart. In fact, in our story today, I think this is so fascinating. This man receives his sight after going his whole life without it. And you would think that everybody would be so excited throwing him that party and that parade and woo! Nope. In fact, the response is interesting. There's three different groups of people, and we can learn from these responses, I believe, today. First one is this, his neighbors respond with skepticism. Everyone say skepticism. Verses 8 through 12, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't that the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, 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 it just looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am that man. Well, then how, how then were your eyes opened, they asked He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go wash at Siloam. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked. Right, They're questioning him. Skepticism. I don't know, he said. You see, his own community did not believe that what Jesus did to him was legit. They were struggling with skepticism. They had such a hard time seeing past what they knew about sight and vision and how all that worked, that they could not believe for themselves that Jesus was the real deal. And if we're not careful, we can do the same thing. If we're not careful, we can focus too much on the wrong sources. If we're deciding to find our, our wisdom and knowledge away from Jesus and who he is, and we start reading different books and these, these articles, and if we're not careful, we can really be consumed with skepticism. And we, fe- we feel lost. Skepticism is a blind spot of the heart. The second group, the Pharisees. The Pharisees respond in judgment. Everyone say judgment. Verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. And again, he put mud on my eyes, the man replied. And I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this uh, this man is not from God, for he doesn't even keep the Sabbath. But others asked, then how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. The Pharisees were so focused on what Jesus had done wrong that they missed what Jesus was doing right in front of them. 
They missed the miracle because they were so focused on proving that he was wrong and they were right and they missed it. And I believe if we're not careful, judgment can become a reality in our life as well. We could be totally missing out on the light of the world, missing out on choosing Jesus because we are choosing to judge people who we believe are wrong. But it blinds us. It blinds us. And we lose track. Judgment is a blind spot of the heart. The third group that we can learn from, his parents respond in fear. Verse 20 says this, We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. And then they flip the script. Ask him. He's of age. They're avoiding. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. You see, his own parents abandoned him in this moment, left him to defend himself because they were afraid of what the Pharisees thought and what the Pharisees were going to do. And I believe that we can get sucked into that same blind spot as well. If we are so afraid of following Jesus because we're worried about what what people will think of our decision, we're worried about what people will say, what they will do to us, we're afraid. Maybe we're afraid to follow Jesus because we are just so afraid of what that means for us. Because we know that it means getting rid of certain parts that are just so hard to get rid of, and that fear will blind us. The reality is, without Jesus, we live our life in the dark. Without a personal relationship with the light of the world, skepticism, judgment, and fear will begin to take over, and we will lose track, and all of a sudden we feel so blind, and we don't know where to turn. But there's a solution. The solution is this. We're called to live in the light. Everyone say light. Oh, say it like you mean it. Say light. Light. We're called to live in the light. To live in a personal, ongoing relationship with Jesus who is the light of the world. That's what we are called to do. And I believe there are three ways that we can do this. There are three ways we see in Scripture that this works out in our lives. The first one is this. This is the how. Engage with the words of Jesus. Everyone say words. Engage with the words of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says this, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of what? The heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered. Catch that word, that's important. And laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. You see, when we spend time in God's word, in the words of Jesus, we begin to see ourselves differently. God's word is living and active, and when we spend time in it, we know the problems that exist in our heart. We know the things that we are called to get rid of because now we know the life that we are called to live. Engage with the words of Jesus, living in the light. The next thing we're called to do is this, engage with the people. Everyone say people of Jesus. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10 says this. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity on anyone who falls and has no one to help them out. We are not created to live life alone. I think Tim did such an amazing job last week talking about this and talking about life groups and why we're so passionate about them. And it's because of this reason right here. When we want to be people who live in the light, we want to surround ourselves with people who also live in the light. They lift us up. They encourage us. They pray for us. My wife, Tara, and I, we, we'll, we will be the first to attest that this is so true with our life group. We, we've just so enjoyed spending time with them and praying with them and texting them and playing games. And We just love what they've done for us. They have made us better people because we weren't made to do life alone. And the last thing we're called to engage in, to live in the light, is this, to engage with the work. Everyone say work. Engage with the work of Jesus. Galatians 5.13 says this, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh, in your own desires, rather. Serve one another humbly in love. We've been given freedom by Jesus to choose ourselves or to choose others, and we have been created to choose others just like Jesus did, to see people who need help, to help them humbly and to serve them. 
We're called to engage with the work of Jesus because when we engage with the work of Jesus, we begin to look like Jesus, the light of the world. And here's the amazing thing. When we live life in the light, when we do this and we have a personal relationship with him, things begin to change, amen? Things will change. And check this out. Skepticism will now turn into truth. We will know the truth about Jesus. We will know who he is. We will know his plan. We will know why he came. We will know his purpose as we discover him more and more. He, he not only said that he's the light of the world, but he says that he is the truth of the world, the way for eternal life. The next thing that will happen, judgment will turn into love. And Jesus, all throughout his ministry, we see him do this over and over again. He breaks down the social barriers and he spends time with people loving them and serving them and just talking to them. And then he tells them about his purpose and why he's there. He shares the gospel with them. And we see him do this with tax collectors who were hated at the time. We see him do this with a Samaritan woman who, who that was totally against the show, social rules to do. Jesus always chose love and compassion over judgment. When we choose Jesus, we choose love. And the next thing, fear transforms into comfort. Our fear that we have in our life and in our current situation will begin to disintegrate because we are following the light of the world. Jesus says this about himself in John chapter 16. This is so powerful. I have told you these things so that in me you may have, what? Peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have come to overcome the world. You see, Jesus provides a supernatural comfort, even in the midst of our biggest fears. Amen? We see that to be true when we live in his life. Now you see, when we don't choose Jesus, we live life in the darkness. And everything in our life without him becomes more difficult and it becomes scarier. Now I thought at one point as I was preparing this message, I thought, what if I did this whole sermon blindfolded? Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> then I realized how difficult that would be because everything's more difficult in the darkness. Now, this summer, I read through the book of John. That was my, just my summer goal, read through John and just dissect it and read. And this story stood out to me. Because uh, uh, Tara and I had a conversation with someone, and we were, we were sharing, you know, talking about us having a child in January, and a, a comment was made, basically questioning, well, well I mean, why, why would you want to have a child in this dark world? We, we, we live in scary times. This is a dark place. And then I started thinking about this future child. I'm like, isn't, isn't that the purpose, though? Is it, isn't my purpose as a father to raise a child in the way of the Lord, in the way of the light, to show that this dark world, that there's still hope? Isn't that the purpose? And I started thinking about that, and I read this story, and I'm like, that's it. I want to lead my child into light. I want to lead my wife in the light. That's my purpose. But here's the reality. Sorry. I can't do that if I can't see. I can't do that if I don't have the light of the world in my life. I can't lead someone if I can't see where I'm going. I can't lead my child to make a difference in this world if I don't even know where I'm going. My prayer is that my child sees that I see the light. Because when you have the light, when you have Jesus, I promise you this. He takes away your skepticism. He takes away that judgment that just consumes you. And he takes away that fear and he says, I'm going to replace it with truth. I'm going to replace it with love. I'm going to replace it with comfort. Because I am the light of the world. As I think about my child, I want them to know that I am a man of the light. 
that I will not be consumed by darkness, but I will be a man of the light. I will be a follower of the light. Because that's what I was created to do. You know, it's, it's funny because people will tell you, man, when you have a, a kid, you won't know what you're doing. Amen. I probably won't. But I know a Savior who knows exactly what I'm supposed to do. I want that light. I want to live a life just like the motto and the response of this blind man. He said, I was blind, but now I see. That's what I want. I want to live a life without fear. I want to live a life without judgment. I want to live a life without skepticism, without darkness. I don't want to be blind. I want to see. And that's what I want for my child. And that's what I want for you. I'm actually going to end with a prayer that, that Paul says in Ephesians. He writes it to the church in Ephesus, and they're struggling with some of this stuff in their own church. And he says something amazing in verse 18. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the people, that, or sorry, that you may know the hope to which he has called you. He says, to the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people. And then he says this, and his great power for us who believe, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. He says, I want the eyes of your heart to be opened, free of blindness, so you can see the power of Jesus in your life. And I'm going to end with this prayer. I'm going to pray it over you. I'm going to pray it over me. I'm going to pray it over my wife and my future child. I'm going to pray this over all of us today because I believe in the power of Jesus. So if you would, close your eyes, bow your heads. And if you need spiritual sight today, if you need the light of Jesus in your life, just take your hands as you close your eyes and lift up your palms to him as I pray this for us today. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and in his uncom incomparably great power for us who believe that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. God, it is my prayer that you would open the eyes of our heart. I pray that we would see you and live in your light. God, take our skepticism, our fear, our judgment, take that from us today and replace it with you. We want to be people of the light. We were blind, but now we see. Amen.